Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah about the power of his word. It does what it will do. It does not return void. God's word is powerful and it accomplishes great things. It accomplished, of course, the creation of the universe. God says, let there be light, and there was. It happened, it was done. It accomplished the redemption of mankind. Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, and it was. And it accomplishes also for us the continuing work of sanctification. Here, perhaps the Holy Spirit is the one speaking speaking in that still, small voice in our hearts each day. We know that God's word has true power. We see the majesty of creation, all of the evidences around us. We see also our own sin and how much it affects us, and therefore we see the power of God's forgiveness. But the third thing that I mentioned, that sanctification thing, this sometimes it's a little bit harder to trust that God's word has true power as God casts the seeds of his word. Sometimes it feels like it's just bouncing right off of our hearts, like the seed on the path. The bird comes and snatches it away. It's hard to buckle down to read the Bible. We often have good intentions, It's hard to make it to church with other priorities and interests popping up. Of course, I'm speaking during normal times, not during the times that we are living. It's also hard even if you do make it to church, it's hard to focus on the scripture readings. It's hard to focus during the sermon. That's because Satan loves to come and to try to snatch away God's word. Beloved seminary professor, uh, named Francis Rossau, he puts it like this. this is, these are his words now. We don't always give the devil his due. Well, the parable of the sower and the seed, our text, it surely does. It says quite flatly that here cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. I think many of us have experienced this. He's continuing. We can listen to a dull, jargon-laden lecture on some topic. We can tune in to a political speech, which is riddled with cliches and abstractions, delivered in a boring manner. But when we are asked to hear a sermon, a message which is of life and death, we're not able to listen. What but a devil can account for such perversity, he says. Or perhaps to put it another way, how many of us are able to pay attention through an entire half-hour pregame show, you pick the sport, able to absorb all of the analysis, all of the predictions of the commentators, or alternately, how many of us are able to follow each dramatic twist in a half-hour reality TV show, but unable to listen to a two-minute gospel reading all the way through. It's not all of our faults. There's a reason for this. The devil hates the word of God, and he will do whatever he can to distract us, like send an airplane over the church. But there are other things that are in opposition to God's word. It's not just the devil, our enemy. It's also our own flesh. It's our own sinful nature. It's our own natural resistance to the things of God. And then on top of that, there are the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth or ambition or power, 
they all promise to give us something. They never fully deliver. Those are the thorns in the parable that come and choke out the fruitfulness of the plant. So we start to think that maybe there is something wrong with this seed. It doesn't seem to be doing what it was supposed to be doing. It doesn't seem to be working, at least not on my heart. Where is the fruit? I'm not seeing 30-fold or 60-fold or 100-fold. I'm not always happy with my own progress as a Christian. My prayer life, my devotional life, my parenting could have more patience, my charity toward others. I think I could be bearing more fruit. Perhaps you may feel the same way as I do. That's when I need to hear this promise from the book of Isaiah that his word will not return to him empty, that God who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember back when the internet was a brand new thing, everything was very novel, and you would go to websites and they were very fond of posting a little banner that looked like caution tape and it would say something like under construction. And there might even be like little orange road cones next to that, little cute graphics. Um, I haven't seen that on a website since the 90s, but that was quite common. And I think of that when I think of the Christian life under construction, work in progress. We, we may be discouraged by our crop yield, but then again, we also may not realize all that God is doing through us and in us. It's not always all visible to us. About the one thing that we can control in all of this is the amount of seed that we expose ourselves to. I heard one military analyst talking about geopolitical stuff and nation versus nation, and, and what, he was, what he said was, quantity is a quality all of its own. Let me say that again. Quantity is a quality all of its own. Now, this came into play in World War II. The Germans, they had far superior everything. They had superior aircraft, superior officers, superior training, better artillery, better tanks. But once that Eastern Front opened up with the Soviets, the Soviets had none of that. They only had one thing, and that was numbers. They would make something, and they would make it just good enough, and then they would crank it out in mass. In that case, quantity beat quality. So let's apply this to God's word. I think quantity matters. Some might say, well, I don't want to open up the Bible right now because I don't have enough time to really study it and really drill down and read all the study notes, so maybe they leave it off for another time when they would be able to go deeper. Or maybe someone with young children said, I don't want to go to church because my kids are going to fuss the whole time. I, I won't hear two-thirds of the sermon anyway, so maybe we just don't go. I'd say that if the encounter with God's word is not the depth and the quality that you would have hoped for, that doesn't matter. Just the number of encounters helps. I've listened to probably hundreds or even thousands of sermons since becoming a Christian, and some of them were amazing. Many of them were maybe a little bit boring, but never after any of them have I ever said, I got absolutely nothing from that. Always came away with something. I've read through the, the Bible now several times, the entire Bible. Some chapters admittedly are much harder to focus on than others. Maybe passages from the book of Numbers or Leviticus or Chronicles, the genealogies and things like that. Even though sometimes I have trouble paying attention and focusing while I read through Scripture, I have never come away with absolutely nothing. So I'd say that in my experience as a pastor, in meeting uh, Christians, many, many Christians, the one factor that I find the most common in the level of Christian maturity 
is whether or not someone is regularly in the Word of God, if they read their Bibles. That's probably the number one thing. As far as if they do that, they will grow. It's, it's evident every single time. They grow, they grow, they grow. I think a close second to that factor would be probably regular worship attendance, which really is the same thing. It's exposing yourself to the word of God. It's giving yourself the opportunity to hear the word, even if not every single thing is, is making its way deep into your heart, but you're, the, it's like more shots on goal. The more shots on goal, some are going to get through. God's word is power. It is um, power to create, power to redeem, and also power to bring about fruit, good works in our lives. It's just our job to kind of place ourselves in a place where we receive that seed, that it comes our way, that we may be changed by its power. And God's word is a powerful thing. Even this morning I, when I was reading at the early service, when I was reading the epistle lesson, I was suddenly very moved by it. It said, it told me that I was an heir, an heir together with Christ. Wow, I'm royalty. You are royalty. And I'm moved by that. I'm encouraged by that. So I pray that the word of God would find its good soil in your hearts, that you would be moved deeply, encouraged in your salvation, encouraged in your relationship with God, but then also moved toward fruit, toward good works that God has prepared for us to do, that, that good fruit may abound 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Amen. <coughs> now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>